Hi, my name is Benedict for Higher Hertz. This video is kind of a companion to the last, which was on Fuzz Plus 3 uh, from Audio Damage. This is Rough Rider 3. Uh, this is actually where I was asked to first to look at um, audio damage. Um, this compressor is been around for forever, which we will look at. And for many people, it has filled the role of my first compressor. There are some good things about it. There are some things to be very aware of about it. To be very fair upfront, audio damage, not only in the name of their company, are pretty upfront about the things that we need to be a little cautious about because of what is designed. The name alone gives us a good sense. It's called Rough Rider. It is designed to be a little heavy handed. Let's have a bit of a listen. What we've got is every track, the drum and bass bass, and the masters using an instance of Rough Rider. Now, as far as I'm concerned, that's a little bit of a smashed mess. These are default settings on every single one of these. We're going to go through after we've done the, uh, the formal part of the program and look at, can we use this a lot more subtly? Because uh, while it will be heavy handed and we will look at what it will do in the heavy handed department, if we're going to use a compressor for many things, it's best that we learn to be subtle with it as well. Let's pop it off the bus. Straight away we can hear that this mix opens up, becomes cleaner, clearer, less smashed mess. So let's go through, we will start by muting all our parts and just look at what the object is. It's a compressor. It now a fully fledged compressor in many ways, as in that it's got all the all the basic things that you need, possibly bar one. Uh, so you've got the ability to tweak the level on the way in. Trouble is it's only plus five dB on the way in. So if you really need to push that level on the way in, you might need to use another device. Um, there is the ability to, to do sidechain, as in sidechain is not the name of the thing, it's called ducking, you can feed the sidechain a signal from somewhere else. We're not going to get into this here because, quite honestly, it's an overused feature. Um, I, I know it's the only way to do the Tiesto thing or whoever first did it, but you know there's better things to do. We can set our ratio from one to one, which is nothing, right the way up to a thousand to one, which is normally called limiting. We can set our threshold, which they've called sensitivity. We can go to, down to minus 60 B, dB. That's a really low threshold, which probably does offset the lack of positive gain. And then we've got up to 30 dB of makeup, which is an awful lot. We can change our attack release settings and change our overall output level. And for those wanting to do parallel compression or New York, then you can mix the pair. It's not my preferred way of doing things, but it's a super popular thing, so it is there. Let's have a look at where this comes from. Audio Damage, this is not, it is sort of a current product. It's always been their leader product, as in let's keep get people through the door using this device. Interestingly, they don't seem to have a better, more fully featured compressor. This seems to be their compressor. Um, and I think that makes sense because Audio Damage, the guys themselves seem to have a very clear path as to where they go and what they do, which is great. I'm all for that. To be fair, it's not really a path that I would be going down myself. But this is where part of why I show how it can be used in ways other than the obliteration of inputs. But we'll look at the obliteration approach. It is free, you can download it, it's a legacy product, so there's no support, but you really don't need any support. There's a little bit of a this knob does that kind of thing, um, but honestly, you shouldn't need much support on this if you know how to use a compressor. If you are getting it as my first compressor, 
then do be aware that this is heavy handed. Definitely not an all purpose compressor. That is best when used to add pumped rhythmic tracks. In other words, it is a mallet. It's not one of those nice little jewelry hammers. It's a great big thumping mallet. And that's why a lot of EDM type people have liked it because it goes straight to ridiculous. Let's have a look. It was first released or marked as released in KVR in September 2008, which makes this over 13 years old. The Rough Rider thing is one of the oldest still running plugins in the VST world. That kind of says something. Now, here's your, your basic knobs. I know that was from forever ago, but it hasn't changed an awful lot. It looks prettier, but it hasn't changed an awful lot. So that's where it comes from. That's how much it costs, which is nothing other than downloading it. This is our drum pattern with no processing whatsoever. We've got nothing happening here. Yes, some of this program, the, the audio is gonna be a little quieter, but because this can range so much in its level, we're, we're gonna to have to make do. We can change our input level. Which just changes how the sensitivity or the threshold thing works. As I said, the side chain we're gonna leave out. Full bandwidth is just resolving a limit from be before, as in, it used to just sound bad. And that was part of its thing. And it has a charm in certain situations with uh, limited bandwidth. So it's a button there that you can choose to turn off if you want to try using the old style limited bandwidth approach. Sidechain, like I said, we're going to leave alone. We've got our ratio, which is from one to one, which means nothing's happening. Now, quick primer on compression, because again, the assumption is that most people who are looking at Rough Rider are looking at my first compressor. Compression is what's called a transform function. Sounds awfully complex, but it is simply a put one thing in, get something else out. There is a clear relationship between the two. So like any transform function, we just need to understand what happens in between the input and the output. And the ratio is the easiest start to that. And that is with a ratio of one to one, whatever comes in goes out. You might go, yeah, what's the point of telling me that? Well, that's, that's your foundation. If we've got a ratio of two to one, and I don't know whether this is a sliding scale inside what we can't read, it might be. And if you're wondering why would we need less than two to one, then um, softer compression, which I'm not sure whether this is gonna do super well, but softer compression can commonly use things like a 1.5 to one for very, very mild compression. But if it's two to one, it means that for every two some things that come in, one goes out. Three to one is gonna be for every three some things that come in, one goes out. So compression is always read off as a something to one. Meaning that if we've got that thousand fingers coming in, we get one finger out. But the measure that we use is decibels, dB. So five dB in, three, four, five, will output one. Simple, but it doesn't work across the whole scale. It doesn't work across the whole volume ramp from zero to fully loud dude. This is where what they call the sensitivity knob comes in, and this is the threshold. If our threshold were set at minus 60 is close enough to silence, then every 5 dB above minus 60 dB, so anything really above silence, is going to be putting out 1 dB, meaning we have to turn the input up super loud to get a reasonable output, or we bring in our makeup gain and add lots of makeup gain because we've just lost all our level. So in more practical terms, we don't want to be compressing right from silence. We want most of that signal to breathe okay, but then just the spiky bits on top, we wanna deal with them. So we might say anything that goes over 12 dB, I want to start crushing. So everything below that threshold, 
minus 12 dB will, get, will come through just fine. And then everything above, for each 5 dB that goes above that threshold, 1 dB is going to come out. So your threshold and your ratio are super important. Makeup gain is simply that. If we've got a threshold of minus 12 and at 5 to 1, we're going to have to push quite a bit of level back because we've lost quite a lot. Even if we were only putting in 5 dB above, we've got 1 dB out. So our overall signal that used to be 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, minus 7 dB, is now sitting at minus 13 dB, meaning we've gained a whole pile of headroom. So we would turn that signal up here by 4 dB. That's just using pure maths, thank you. So it's important to understand this about compressors. If you don't understand it, it'll always seem like some kind of weird magical malarkey. It's not. But you don't work it purely by the numbers. They just give you an idea of how this thing is working. So we've then got attack and release. This is where it gets even more complex. We can have, in theory, an instant attack, but like anything that relies on physics, there's no such thing as instant because the sensor in here, the little leprechaun, the one that turns the, the light on your fridge when you open the door, has to become aware of this event that was over the set threshold. If I could do accents, I would. Uh, and then has to go, oh, I need to turn the volume down. And that's going to take time. And so this just gives us a rough indicator of how much time we're going to allow between, oh, we've just gone above signal, and it's going to take us to turn that level down a significant enough amount. There are numbers attached to this, but I'm not going to bore you with them. So the slower the attack, the more stuff will get through over the threshold before it starts to clamp down. And then release means that once the signal's fallen below that threshold, how quickly will it start to let that level come back up again? So signal goes over, a uh, leprechaun inside the fridge goes, whoop, turns the level down. Signal goes back above the threshold or reaches the threshold again. And he goes, oh, better start turning that back up again. So there's a constant knob twiddler inside here. They're listening to what's called the side chain and moving the volume knob. That's very simplistically how this works. And then we can mix as I showed between signal and like original signal and compressed signal. I'm not going to get too much into that because it's a, not a thing I like. And then we can finesse the overall output level. It's not entirely common to have both a makeup and an output level, but that's kind of nice. Um, again, it's only got a plus 5 dB throw and a minus 6 dB, 60 dB, which is not fully silenced, but close enough. So overall, all of that's pretty workable. My good and bad on the product per se, might as well uh, shrinkify this up. Now, it is an easy compressor. And that's, that's a good thing because compression is a bit arcane. And if you're head's a little bit explodey after that description, I do understand. But compression is an important part of music, especially if you're trying to do the modern thing where everything is just heavily, heavily over compressed. The only way to get that sound is to heavily, heavily over compress. My personal suggestion, make better music, but you know, that's just how it's going to be. It's pretty. I know that shouldn't be relevant, but for a lot of people, they do want things to be pretty and amusing. It's also free. So it's a pretty darn good device. It's very good at what it says it's going to do. Um, it's got its limits, but it's a pretty darn good device that is physically pretty, that is pretty easy to use. They're all good things in the my first compressor kind of a market. It's limits. There is a limited input gain. As I said, that's somewhat offset by the fact that you have an incredibly deep 
threshold amount. Often thresholds won't go below sort of minus 32 or so dB. Minus 60 dB is just immense. Uh, so chances are you've got a resolution there bearing you've got 30 dB of makeup gain. So odd, but that's how it is. Probably my biggest frustration with it is metering. It does have this pretty little display that when something's happening, we can see it doing this downward peaky thing. And that's showing us gain reduction. That's showing us the leprechaun turning the knob like this. It's showing us his action. But there's no actual readout of how much gain reduction we've got. How many dB of gain reduction have we got there? There's really no way of knowing. Now, plenty of people would be like, oh, but you just do it all by ear, man. And to some extent, I agree with them. But you know what? I kind of like to have the information. There's no real reason why they couldn't give it because they've gone to the trouble of giving us readouts on everything else. Plus, the input signal and the output signal are displayed here, but they're displayed in a way as to be quite useless in terms of being able to compare them. Smallish things, but things that will cause people to misuse or come unglued in their compressination activities. And moving forward, looking through this, we have our drum pattern. There's quite a marked change between clean, dry, and this. And it's actually changing, yes, it's actually changing the treble a lot. Commonly what happens with compressors, especially heavy-handed compressors, is that they squish the high end first because they're little sounds. Maybe it's in part because this is a fairly bright, trebly sort of hi-hatty kind of a thing, but it's a noticeable difference. There is a sound in this compressor. Is that good or is that bad? Bearing in mind a lot of people are trying to brighten up their mixes, trying to create sparkle, then it's probably a good thing. Um, worst comes to worst, you can always use a, a high-end EQ and just back that down some. But bearing in mind, I think this has got some kind of heavy-handed saturation in this. As Paul Third's, I think, recent video uh, has just pointed out to us, the truth is, and I have spoken about this already, uh, the truth is that most analog VST have far more saturation, noise, harmonics mess in them than comparable analog units. So just be aware that this might be on the heavy-handed side and change your sound. Roll with it. Now, we can look at our ratios. Nothing to a thousand to one. We don't have a lot happening here, but let's go heavy-handed. We might just want to use a little bit of makeup gain here. Try and keep these levels seem seeming audible. Now this is actually surviving surprisingly well because this is the nature of what this thing does. Even though that's what's called a limiting range, this is not a brick wall limiter. So things will still get through this. As you saw there, the first kick drum, there was a pop splat on the beginning of it because it took that time. We got 10 milliseconds here, but even if we set it to zero, it's been pretty fast, but there will always be a little bit of time, so it might leak a little. But it doesn't claim to be total. I shall not pass. But a thousand to one is pretty stupid. Hear how that's really completely changed the balance of this loop. Actually, 
actually a certain amount of that is coming from the clipping. See, it's hard to balance these. But it's prone to really hopping heavily on our material. There we've got a strong sense of rhythm going. This is actually a fairly good device to learn the concept of glue compression. Not that I'd use this for glue compression, as we've already heard, it's heavy handed for that. But we can hear a groove coming out of this now, which is not there so much before. It's pretty straight. But we're emphasizing the groove. That's a great thing to learn in compression because that's the essence of bus or glue compression. This is not what I'd use to do it, but we definitely can do it. So we can get pretty heavy handed and it's unlikely to cause a lot of the nastiness that you will find in more sensitive, more thoughtful compressors. That's its whole thing. Its whole reason for living is to be heavy handed. So you can take your loops, and do that whole squishifying thing to them. Now I think that's far too squished. We'll go with a high ratio, just want to find a point where It just sounds kind of splatty right from the get-go. Let's pull this down. We are getting that groove, but we're also getting the splattiness, which I'm not keen on. Okay, so to answer my own question, is the one point one to one and the two to one, is there anything in between? Yes, there most definitely is. So we can use this for a kind of softer compression. I'm gonna say I'm not unhappy with that. Cool. So we'll say that's our, that's our drum. Now we're gonna look at bass. Mute that. Okay, yeah. Apart from adding a pile of level. There's a bit of distortion as we move the controls because the maths is trying to keep up, so it warps the math. This is to be expected. Now we have to work out what we want to do with this bass. It's kind of long and solid. And if we're not careful, it's just going to through the whole mix. And, and I absolutely don't want that to be the case. But that's actually working quite nicely. 
but I am going to pull that back just a little bit because we're going into a rhythm bus. And this is a pretty important part of mixing. You don't have to do this, but it makes a noticeable difference in terms of pulling your um, drum and bass together or pocketing them, as in putting them both in the same pocket. So let's see if we can groove them. I don't want a lot of movement here. Very easy to say, okay, well, let's just hammer these things. But no good has been done here. See how they, well, they're squished. There's, there's no joy to be had there. So you're gonna look for a relatively low ratio. Once we've found the point at which it starts to swing, it seems to swing here. Yep, it's swinging there. So we will find a point at which it... Cool. So what we've achieved so far is we have got, we'll turn that off, that off, that off. Given the drums more presence, punch, snap, sizzle, lots of sizzle. The bass we've now given punch and groove. And bringing that drum and bass together so that they're pocketed, so that they work as one. Cool. Now, we've got this pluck sound. Only all the settings in this seem to be different from what they were left in. Don't know what the story is there. It's a pluck, so we're looking for movement and the point where it comes through. If we just squish it, There's no real joy in that. So we could be looking at even quite a slow attack. Right. That's emphasizing the important part of this. So we can pull it back. Watch our outputs. Okay, fair enough. I don't know why the settings are all different. Um, they're consistently all different, which is odd. So let's see that this fits in with where we're at so far. So that pluck has now become, it's more rolly. It's got more grooviness to it. You'll notice that the echo, the delay here, is in front of the compressor. That is one way to do it. The other way is after the compressor. After. Pre. I 
tend to do it pre quite a bit for certain things. Definitely for guitars, especially if they're going to have a 50s, 60s kind of a feel, country or anything like that, the echo will probably go before the, um, the actual <laughs> amplifiers, before the distortion, before your amps and all of that. Old school. And you get this really great feel from it. But some things will go better after. Just bear in mind that that compressor will change the balance. But that's one of the great things is that when you get the feel right, the compressor is constantly causing that balance of dry to wet with your delay to actually move around, which makes the signal overall more exciting because it's harder to just go, yeah, I know what's going on, I'm turning that one off. So we've got plenty of movement now. And because of that, we can actually take a little bit off the level of that because there's so much movement. And last but not least, our strings. Yes, they are using an instance of Audio Damages Fuzz Plus. So a lot of the filtering's done in the Fuzz Plus. Uh, I liked it that much. I thought, I'm going to do that again and carried it forward. And yes, I did put a noise gate on because while we can't hear that, uh, this is sitting at about minus 65 dB of noise. And we could leave that alone, but I'm just showing you. There you go. That's it. So we pull in Rough Rider, which is not really designed for strings, but yeah. We're gonna we're gonna make do. So apart from adding level, it's not actually doing anything. It does seem to make it brighter, and I'm not sure whether that's level. It is sneaky, it shouldn't happen. With, with nothing happening, we shouldn't be getting level gain. Now we can hear that this signal's actually changing as we change the wet-dry balance. Something's happening in here that is not on the front panel. See, it almost seems to get louder at 50%. Something's going on under the hood that we are not aware of. That probably is that they are running maybe a variant of their, <laughs> of their fuzz drive unit or something. There's something going on under the hood here that is... Um, well, like I say, it's probably in the heavy-handed, um, let's oversaturate things kind of approach. I know it's super, super popular, especially in EDM mixing, but just be aware of it. Now here it just kind of, it gets ragged pretty quickly. This is not really the use that Rough Rider was designed for. You do need to go carefully on strings, on pads, otherwise they'll just pump and, and glitch around. Not nice, not nice at all. Okay, we're just getting a little bit of general kind of riding our levels. We could even go out a lot slower, perhaps. Yeah, now I'm not hearing that 
well, it's hysteriosis. A little bit like there's a um, sample and hold on the level. Uh, we, we want that to be really smooth. It's just if our pads, and pads will often just suddenly take a swell, especially if they've got a phaser or a chorus or something, suddenly everything swells up. We want to be able to just pull that down as it's happening. So this probably is achieving that fairly nicely. Plus changing the overall output level. That's probably okay. Let's pop that back in the mix. It's working. We've had to go a lot softer on this, but we've we've gotten there. So if we were to take our mix just at the moment, bearing in mind there's nothing on the masters, and turn each of these processes off, and then we'll work our way back down one after another. Whole mix, no compression. Drums in. Notice how that actually changes the relationship with the bass. I'll do that again. Off. Suddenly the bass becomes tighter, becomes better because we're pocketing better. Hot bass. Now they've got this real lockstep to them, which is great. That's exactly what we wanted. The rhythm bus, which is processing drums and bass. Pretty subtle, but we've got so much of that's already been done that the, we, we really can't go too far on this. And there are only a couple of compressors that I have that I find do this beautifully every time. Um, C1L1 um, Molot uh, does that very, very nicely. Well, the C1L1 does. I'm not so keen on the, the Molotok, uh, but the C1L1, um, which is a rack extension, does that beautifully every time. Um, but this, this has added some value. If we were to take these out, it has added a little bit of value, but we've got so much that's already been achieved on their own that this doesn't need to work hard at all. Now pluck. So hopefully what you notice there is that when the compressor comes on the pluck, we've got more punch through of each of those notes, particularly the beginning of each what we might call phrase, starts to punch through. I'll let you listen again, off. So we've got a more marked sense of here's the beginning and we can hear our echoes. So it's giving us a clearer sense of the phrasing. So again, it's grooving our pluck. Strings. Not real noticeable on this because it's pretty even sound in the first place, but they do become a little bit more even, a little bit more assured. The downside on that string uh, is that it potentially becomes a little bit less characterful, but it's not a super characterful string. Anyway, not exactly doing a characterful line, but it is a pad, it's filling out the piece. So in each case, all of these are doing the job that they are meant to do. Let's now look at the masters, so to speak. It's out at the moment. Now this has done the big no-no of just suddenly adding a whole pile of level. But it does not like this when this happens. So let's work with no makeup gain to start with. Two to one ratio is gonna be fine probably. And let's look at gluing this together, which means we're gonna start heavy handed. Well, I've gotta go this way. 
find a point at which the piece kind of grooves. You can hear it very strongly there with the 21 milliseconds attack and 10 milliseconds release, it actually lurches. But that tells us that we've probably got the beginning of our groove right. But there at about 69 milliseconds on the release, it's smoothed that groove out a little bit. If we want that groove to be more pronounced, yeah, we can drop that right back. Now, this is awful. It sounds terrible, but we're not listening to how it sounds. We're just listening to how it feels. We just want that sense of groove. So now we can back this right off. And this is where a proper readout would help tremendously because there may be a little bit of gain reduction that their pretty meter doesn't show. So I can't tell if there's a dB or a fraction of a dB or 78 dB and their meter only starts showing things at 80 dB of crush. I have no idea. That's frustrating. Because suddenly we go from nothing to apparently lots of something. It definitely sounds a little bit more controlled, but we are possibly losing some groove. Hard to tell, and again, this is not designed for this, but I think we've gotten a tiny, tiny bit of something that just makes it sit. It feels a little more controlled, just a little nicer overall, just pulled together a little bit overall. It's a heavily compressed mix, um, but it's, it's working, I think. Bearing in mind, I'm in these things. My outputs kind of where I want them to be. Although, I gotta say, this is, this is acting kind of slow. And that's okay, but normally after this I would have something that's gonna absorb some of the faster transients before I have it in the clipper, but I don't. So we're showing a little bit of limiting here, even though this is a tiny bit on the slow side, even though, our crest factor is a little low, so we might even look at pushing a little bit more out of here. I'm gonna say, okay, that's fine. I can't hear through speakers, but you see the idea of what we've got. The Rough Rider has helped. So if we were to go from absolutely nothing, be nice to have one universal switch for this, but I know that's super hard to do. The last one's very noticeable because we've got a couple of dB of gain. So we've got three or four dB of actual gain happening inside the plugin. We've also got quite a lot of harshness. These high hats to me sound just too harsh. Um, that's largely the plugins doing. Okay, they're a bit flat and papery there, but then they get kind of a little bit splatty and a little bit harsh.
there's definitely a brightening in there as well. Part of that's level, part of that's just their thing. Uh, but by pulling back the, the hi-hats, which are splatty, then we've got a more comfortable mix overall. I'd even suggest that we might pull back some of that level so that it doesn't sound so kind of pushed, pushed, pushed. That said, push, push, pushed has been the, the most fashionable thing ever for the past 20 years, but there's a lot of talk in the communities about pulling back from that push, 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 which is good, it's needed, because what's happened is that the quality of the music has disappeared because it's hard to write good music when everything is just splashed up against the wall. Uh, and the fact that people aren't writing good music, then as a result of them not doing it in the first place, then the kids are growing up hearing not good music and they're writing music that's worse and worse, which meant that's why we've had so much overdriving everything uh, to try and make things sound interesting when they're harmonically not interesting in the first place because they just weren't composed uh, and making it, you know, turning the level up too much just to try to fill the fact that it's missing all the things that it should have. It's, it's missing the intricacy of, of either composition or of passion. The only problem with um, auto-tuned vocals is it strips all the human passion out of them. Um, they might be technically in tune, but they still sound awful. And they sound more awful because they've taken away natural expression from the, the singer. And a singer who's not super skilled, you know, is not Freddie Mercury, all they've got to go on is their passion. And the electronics and of, you know, like um, auto-tune, Melodyne, any of those sorts of here, let's electronically tune it and magically make it seem like you're in tune. Ugh! It's just dehumanizing. Uh, so it's taking out the nuance, the humanity, the passion. And then the sense to try and resolve that is more splatty saturation, more overdrives, more overdoing the the compression and the and the final level to try to fill to try and get back what has been stripped out in the first place either by not composing right or by using terrible vocal processing uh, so rough rider is good at what it does which is taking particularly rhythmic sections you hear that it really did kind of in its own way excel on the drums the bass uh, and the pluck very very nice um, it has struggled, but we've got there with the string and a little with the um, with the master compression, but it was never really designed for those. But if you're using them there, just be aware you're using this out of purpose, so you've really got to find a way to make it be subtle, because if you just go for another layer of heavy-handed, then all you're going to do is make it hard to make good music, which will mean that you're probably going to do more of what just caused you problems to try and solve the real problem, which is too much splat, too much compression and overall level. So bottom line, it is a cool device. Rough Rider is a cool device. It's not what I personally would recommend as a my first compressor. However, I can see that it would be popular because it appears to work pretty heavily very quickly but that's the whole design of it and therein lies its limit or its potential problem so long as you understand that and are either going to ameliorate its limits as you saw me try and do here or merely recognize that it's great for some things and not use it for others if you're not going to spend any money um, 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 um tdr katelnikov it would, can be very very subtle uh, in terms of compression so it's going to do a far nicer job on mixes than is this thing because it's better designed for that um the lack of ability to see what gain reduction is really happening the pretty picture the sliding is amusing it's cute makes us feel special and producery but i'm not here to feel special and producery i'm here to put something down that i think has told the story right and seeing everything else, if nothing was marked with anything that was just like, this is an ears only compressor, fair enough. But it's not. We've got a lot of eyes on stuff. It's telling us numbers. And then it's refusing us to give us one of the most important numbers, which is how hard are we hitting this? So I have no idea 
what's really happening here, which makes it harder to actually make sensible makeup gain, because if I have a gain reduction meter, look, there's lots of space that tells me you're losing 3 dB in this process, then I know that I can move that to 3 dB or thereabouts, rather than going, oh, where does it, where does it seem right? Doesn't mean that the device is not usable, but it means it's far from the first thing that I would reach for, for anything other than overdoing it. But a great compressor that's more sensitive can commonly be used to really heavily overdo things because you've got that sensitivity. But if you're coming at this as a my first compressor, there's plenty it will do just so long as you don't let it overdo things. Nice unit, really shouldn't bitch too much for the price and the fact that it comes from a company called Audio Damage and it's called Rough Rider. So a lot of what I've been asking it to do is a little outside of its purview. Overall, pretty happy, uh, except I'm not, also I'm not super keen on its brightening flavor, but I tend not to like compressors that do the brightening thing, at least without me being able to be in control of it. However, I do understand that that's what a lot of people do look for. So if that's kind of a thing, if you feel like, oh, my, my, my sounds tend to be a bit murky and not, not have clarity, then this will help with that at the trade-off of that you have less control over how that's happening than if you were to use either a neutral compressor or a compressor that is going to darken a little bit because that's what compressors do. And then you're using either a, another process, which is either your own saturation or your EQ, because that's why God gave you those knobs and that way you'll get perhaps a smoother thing but people love saturation and this obviously has its own kind of <laughs> let's dump lots of chocolate sauce on top of things kind of cool so my name is benedict for higher hertz go out try this device if you have any questions please not about support for audio damage uh, but if you have any questions sort of in general about the content in here then hit the subscribe button first, please, and then ask away. If it's about a particular thing in your mix saying I do this and it sounds like this, I can't tell if I can't hear it. So the rules must be get OBS or something like that, just like what you're watching here uh, on screen so that I can hear exactly what your mix sounds like and actually see what's going on. I can see your settings and then I can probably give you a sensible answer. Please do not go taking photographs of your screen. I will not respond to photos or videos of screens because it just I got, I got nothing i got nothing so benedict for higher hertz there's higherhertz.com pop on over there different channel of information there as well uh, keep making music and the most important thing have a great day